All right, good evening. My name is Jeffrey Johnson, and I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Voyages of Discovery series. On behalf of Allison Donnell, Dean of the Thomas Harriet College of Arts and Sciences at ECU, I welcome all of you to this very special event with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. This year is the 14th season of the Voyages of Discovery, which is the premier lecture series at East Carolina University. Tonight marks not only the first time that Voyages is hosting a live streaming event, but also the first time that the series has a unifying theme, which for this year is climate, water, and environment. Both the widespread and devastating fires raging currently in the Western United States and the realities of ever more extreme weather conditions and weather events vividly remind us that tonight's event is a timely one that requires our urgent responses. I trust that you have had the opportunity to view the Voyages website, which can be found at voyages.ecu.edu. That's voyages.ecu.edu. This website has information about our two speakers in the spring, as well as a detailed overview of Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who holds an endowed professorship at Texas Tech University, where she serves as co-director of that institution's climate center. In order not to delay the appearance of our guest speaker any longer, I won't repeat those details found on the website. You can, you can read them for yourselves. For the sake of brevity, I wish to say that we are delighted to have with us such an accomplished and celebrated atmospheric scientist and climate expert. The ECU Pirate Nation welcomes you, Professor Hayhoe. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone who is attending this virtual event. What we're gonna be talking about is we're gonna be talking about four questions. Is climate changing? Are humans responsible or is it just natural? Why does it even matter? And what are we supposed to do about it? So I wanna know which question are you most interested in knowing the answer to? Are you most interested in knowing is climate changing? Are humans responsible? Why does it matter? Or what can you do? It looks like we're sitting around 68, 70% people want to know what they can do. About 22% want to know are humans responsible, which is a very good question. And then 5% want to know is this even happening? And 3% want to know why does it matter? All right, we are going to be talking about all of these, but we're going to be ending with the last one. But let me just tell you something. If you're here for the answer to the last question, the answer to the last question will involve knowing the answers to the previous questions. So don't just tune out until we get to the last question. You want to pay attention as we go along. All right. So question number one, is climate changing? Well, these days, whenever we see a headline that says there's a heat wave, people say, oh, that must be global warming. And then when they see a headline like we saw just the other week, record snow in Colorado after Labor Day, people say, oh, if it's cold, where's global warming right now? You've probably even thought that yourself. I know I actually have too. Here's the thing. Weather is what happens from day to day, week to week, and even year to year. Weather is what our brain remembers. Weather is like a single tree. What's climate? Climate is the forest. Climate is every single tree, in other words, every single day, for not just a year, not just 10 years, for at least 20 to 30 years. And our brains are not built to remember climate. I don't know about you, but I cannot remember the temperature, let alone the rainfall or the humidity or anything else. I can't remember the temperature on every single day of the year for 20 to 30 years and then add up all those numbers in my head and fit a trend line to it to see if it's going up or down. I can't do that. that. But I can remember specific weather events that I have lived through in the past. We remember weather, but we don't remember climate. Weather is the ups and downs. So hot and cold, wet and dry, wherever we live, we experience weather. But climate is the long-term average of weather. So in other words, your average temperature, your average precipitation, that's climate. Also, the flood of record, the drought of record, the extremes we've had in the past, that is also our climatic range. 
So when we're talking about a single heat wave or a single snowstorm, you can see where I'm going here, right? That doesn't tell us about climate change. To look at climate change, we have to look at weather over what? Over at least 20 to 30 years to see if it's changing. We know that wherever we live, we are subject to weather and climate disasters naturally, right? These happen no matter where you live. In fact, where I live in Texas, they get more of these billion dollar events than any other state. Because in Texas, you get pretty much everything. You get ice storms and snowstorms and blizzards and dust storms and haboobs and tornadoes and hail and, of course, hurricanes and droughts and floods. But the Carolinas are definitely one of the states that are darker red, too. So we get these disasters naturally all the time. And that's just part of living on this planet. We get floods. We get hurricanes. We get water shortages and droughts, we get record-breaking wildfires, we get weather all the time. So now I'm going to ask you, and this question's a little bit harder, you have to answer this question with a word. So what memorable event have you lived through? Have you lived through a drought, a flood, a hurricane? Yes, I'm seeing a lot of hurricanes here. Um, a blizzard, snowmageddon, Oh my goodness, I feel like people here have lived through almost every hurricane. So we've got Hurricane Floyd, Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane Florence, um, Hurricane Fran, Hurricane Dennis. <laughs> oh, we've got an earthquake there too. Okay, tornadoes and hurricanes, yes. Hurricane Harvey, we've got one somebody there. All right. Oh, a J Japanese earthquake, wow. Interesting, Hurricane Hugo. So interesting story. I was in a friend's sailboat, helping him sail his boat from Baltimore down to the Caribbean, and we just missed Hurricane Hugo when we got to Bermuda. We got there the day after Hurricane Hugo. We were following the hurricane down. I would say that this is probably, you are probably the, the group with the most hurricane experience, different hurricane experience I have ever talked to. All right, and I see a few more people put their comments in the chat too. Let's see. Yep, we got lots of hurricanes in the chat too. All right. So we know that this is just a normal part of life on this planet, right? And we know that one event doesn't show that climate is changing. So the questions we have to ask are these. We have to say, are our long-term average conditions changing over at least 20 to 30 years? And are our weather extremes changing at all, becoming more frequent or stronger or bigger or more intense? So we have to look at the long-term changes. And when we look at these long-term changes, we see that the answer to both of these questions is generally yes. So at the global scale, from year to year, global temperature goes up and down. That's weather. But decade by decade by decade, it steadily ticks upwards. That's climate. It is not only temperature that we use to see if the planet is warming. We use all kinds of natural thermometers, like what? Like looking at melting ice, like looking at when the peach trees blossom. My colleague here in Texas is a biologist, and when he first moved here, he planted a tree, peach tree in his backyard. Being a biologist, he wrote down the date that that peach tree flowered every year until he had to cut it down two years ago. And when he cut the peach tree down two years ago, after it had been in his backyard for almost 30 years, it was flowering on average 20 to 30, or sorry, two to three weeks earlier in the year than when he first planted it. We also know that all kinds of invasive species are moving northward. Uh, you are probably very familiar with kudzu, right? Kudzu is an invasive Japanese vine that was brought in during the Great Depression and farmers were encouraged to plant it to feed to their cows. And now, of course, it's known as the vine that ate the south. But did you know that kudzu is kept at bay by cold winter temperatures? As temperatures have been warming, kudzu has been creeping northward. It is all over southern Illinois, and about 10 years ago, they found kudzu in Canada. Yes, but they couldn't remove it because it was on private property, and kudzu was not on the list of Natural Resource Canada's invasive species because they never thought it would make it to Canada. 
Similarly, we've got Lyme disease and deer ticks moving all the way north, things that you may be very used to that people never saw further north. We're seeing all kinds of changes, sometimes, sometimes right in our backyard. And if you look around the whole world and you look at all the natural thermometers that are showing us that yes, it's warming in the Carolinas, it's warming in the Southeast, it's warming across the US, and it's warming across the world, you know how many different independent lines of evidence we have? 26 and a half thousand of them. Trees, insects, birds, butterflies, sea level rising, glaciers melting, all kinds of changes in our world are showing us that yes, the planet is indeed getting warmer. If we look at the changes in the United States specifically, you can see that annual temperatures and winter temperatures have been increasing the most. And increasingly across the Southeast, the summer hasn't been getting as warmer. Why not? Well, as you know, what's it like in the summer? It is not only hot, it's what? Humid. And so part of what's happening as there's more energy in the earth system is it's actually causing it to get more humid. So if you just look at temperature, you don't see the whole picture in the southeast, it's also getting more humid. So now we get to question number two, and this is an important one. This is one that about 20% of you really wanted the answer to. And believe me, I think it's an interesting question to ask. So whether or not you want the answer, listen, because I think it's pretty cool. How do we know that humans are responsible? Because hasn't climate changed in the past for natural reasons? Yes, it absolutely 100% has. And the reason why it's changed in the past is because of changes in energy from the sun, or because of natural cycles, or because of big volcanic eruptions. So when we see climate changing today, we can't just say, oh, it's got to be humans. No, we have to say, could it be a natural factor first? And only then, if it's not, would we say maybe it's humans. So let's look at each one of these to see if it could be getting warmer because of a natural factor first. We're going to start with the sun. So if we we're getting warmer because of the sun, the sun's energy would have to be going up. Kind of like when you turn the dimmer switch on a lamp, right? When you turn it up, it gets brighter. When you turn it down, it gets cooler. So, and, and less light. So the sun's energy does go up and down over time. Has it been going up lately? It turns out the answer is no. The sun's energy over the last 50 years has been going down, not up. So if we were being controlled by the sun right now, we'd be getting cooler, not warmer. Okay, if it's not the sun, could it possibly be natural cycles? Natural cycles are like El Nino. You might have heard of El Nino. During an El Nino, more heat goes from the ocean into the atmosphere. During a La Nina, more heat goes from the atmosphere into the ocean. During a natural cycle, heat gets moved around the climate system from east to west, north to south, ocean to atmosphere and back again. Natural cycles are kind of like a teeter-totter or a seesaw, right? When one side goes up, the other side goes down. So natural cycles can't make the whole planet warmer. All they can do is move heat from one part of the planet to the other. A famous example of a natural cycle was the medieval warm period. I don't know if you've heard of that. That was when all the Vikings got out their margaritas and went on a cruise to Greenland. Just kidding. It was actually still quite cold back then. Greenland was never green. It was still covered in ice, but it was just a little bit warmer than average during the medieval warm period so that people were able to settle around the edges of the ice sheet in Greenland at that time. So people often say, well, wasn't it warmer than average then? So how do we know it isn't just the same natural cycle? What do natural cycles do? How do they warm one part of the earth? by taking heat from another part of the Earth, right? So let's look at a map of what the Earth looked like back in the medieval times. And you might say, well, how are you gonna look at a map of temperature in medieval times? They didn't have thermometers. You're right, they didn't. But we scientists have natural thermometers, like tree rings, 
and ice cores, and even historical manuscripts, and pollen records, and stalactites and stagmalites and caves. And we put all this together, and we can get a picture of what the world looked like hundreds and even thousands of years ago. And this is what it looked like. You see, over the North Atlantic, right around Greenland there, there is a warm spot. The orangey colors are the warm spot. That's where the medieval warm period was. But now, if you're good at geography, go over to this side and look at Siberia. In Siberia, at the same time, it was the medieval cold period. Why? Because it was a natural cycle. So part of the heat came from here and it went over there. So this is what a natural cycle looks like. So then we can say, well, what does it look like today? If it's only warmer over the United States and it's colder somewhere else, obviously it's a natural cycle, right? Here's what the world looks today on ex like, here's what the world looks like today on exactly the same scale. In fact, this is a bit of an old figure. It's 10 years old. It would look even pinker today. It is not a natural cycle. The entire planet is warming. There is another one though that it could be, and that is volcanoes. Now, I don't know if you've heard this, but I've had many people say, Catherine, don't you know that one volcanic eruption produces more pollution than all the people in the world over maybe you know, a year or 10 years or even more? I have heard that, but unfortunately it's not true. What do volcanoes do? When they erupt, they produce all kinds of little particles that, if it's a really big eruption, get all the way up to the upper atmosphere, and there they act like an umbrella reflecting the sun's energy back to space. So what happens if you put up an umbrella on a sunny day? It keeps you a little bit cooler, right? In the same way, a volcanic eruption is like an umbrella for the Earth. It actually cools us down. In fact, back in the 1800s, there was a major eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia. It was so big, and there were so many particles ejected into the upper atmosphere, and that umbrella was so thick, and it lasted for so long, almost three years, that the summer after the eruption was known as the year without a summer. Crops failed all over the world. Napoleon's armies were frozen out when they tried to invade Russia. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein because she was trapped inside all year because it was so cold and rainy. Volcanoes absolutely have affected us in the past, but they don't produce heat trapping gases in large amounts. They produce a tiny amount of heat trapping gases, the equivalent of maybe three medium sized US states, but they produce a lot of particles that actually cool the planet. Now there is one more natural suspect we haven't talked about. And if you have kids or grandchildren, I'm sure you've heard a lot about this one. It is the ice ages, whoops. How do we know we're not just getting warmer after the last ice age? Because warming after the last ice age peaked about six to 8,000 years ago. And since then we were getting cooler, ready to head into the next ice age until something happened very recently, just a couple of hundred years ago. So if you want to dig into this a little bit more, I have a YouTube series called Global Weirding. In fact, let me type that in the chat right now so you can click on it if you want to. Just a second here. It's always easier when you have a link to click on, isn't it? So www.globalweirdingseries.com and you can subscribe. We're going to have new episodes coming out starting in January our, on our latest season. We're a little delayed because of coronavirus like everybody, right? But we have an episode there that talks specifically about how do we know this isn't just a natural cycle. So if you want more on that, check out Global Weirding. But now I wanna move on. Now that we know it's not the sun, we know it's not natural cycles, we know it's not volcanoes, we know it's not the ice ages, how do we know it's humans? We know it's humans because our planet has a natural blanket of heat trapping gases that keep us at the perfect temperature for life. The sun's energy shines down and goes through this blanket like a window. The earth absorbs the heat energy and heats up and then it gives off heat energy. And just like a blanket traps your body heat on a cold night, keeping you warm, in the same way, this amazing natural blanket of heat trapping gases traps the Earth's heat, keeping us over 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we would be otherwise. 
we would be a frozen ball of ice if we did not have this amazing natural blanket. So at this point, you're probably wondering, well, you just said this is a natural blanket and it's the reason we have life on earth. So how is this connected to humans? It's connected to humans because when we dig up and burn fossil fuels, which consist of coal and natural gas and oil, when we dig up and burn fossil fuels, they produce the same heat trapping gases that are in our natural blanket, the same ones, carbon dioxide, methane, and more. And what's happening is they are building up in our atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around our planet, a blanket it does not need and was never designed to have. Just as you would if somebody snuck into your room when you were sleeping and put an extra blanket on top of you that you did not need, in the same way, our planet is heating up because we are wrapping an extra blanket around it. Now you might say, well, that sounds fine, but how long have you really known this? I mean, are you really sure? So I want to ask you this question. How long do you think we've known most of what I just showed, showed you? Have we known most of it since the 1850s or the 1900s or the 1950s or when Al Gore showed up and told us all? Just kidding. All right, we have, let's see, we've got 48%, 45% for 1950s. 1900s is a little less popular. In second place, we've got the 1850s. Okay. All right, it looks, oh, Oh, okay. It looks like we're in a dead tie for the 1850s and 1900s, and 1950s is the winner. All right, I have the answer for you. Ready? Here we go. It turns out the correct answer is A. Yes. How long have we known most of this? Since these scientists. And these are the real pictures. They are not these, you know, fake old timey pictures where your family dresses up in Western outfits and takes a picture in black and white. These are the real people. So we've known about the natural blanket that keeps our planet over 60 degrees warmer than it should be since Joseph Fourier in the 1820s. We have known which gases make up the blanket since the work of John Tyndale in the 1850s. We have known that coal mining was producing more of these gases since John Tyndale's work also in the 1850s. And Mrs. Eunice Foote, who was an American scientist from upstate New York, she is the one who discovered that the planet would be getting warmer if carbon dioxide levels were higher. And she said that in 1856. Isn't that amazing? Then Svante Arrhenius was a Swedish chemist who calculated by hand in the 1890s how much the world would warm if we doubled levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We haven't quite doubled them, but they've increased by 50% already, and his numbers are exactly what we see happening today. And then Guy Callender, the last one here, he was a British engineer who collected weather station data from around the world and actually showed that from the 1880s to the 1930s, how much the planet had already warmed. Isn't that amazing? So not only have we looked at every natural suspect, the sun, natural cycles, volcanoes, we have known about this for over 150 years. All right, so now we are on to question number three. Why does this matter? Now, interestingly, this was the question that the least people wanted the answer to, but, I'm going to show you something interesting. When we actually ask people questions about climate change, it turns out that this is the question where the most people miss the boat. After this section, you will understand why. Here we go. So if you look at the whole country, these are a series of maps from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. You can go there yourself and you can look up results by county. And I think I have the result for Pitt County. Yes, right there, see? You can look up the results by county and by congressional district. They ask about 30 different questions. I'm just gonna show you a few of them. And you can see that most people in the US would agree that yes, global warming is happening. So anywhere that's orange is more than 50% and the darker orange it is, the more people say yes. If it's less than 50%, then it's blue. Okay, so is global warming happening? Most people say yes. And in Pitt County, it's a little bit higher, 74 as opposed to 72%. 
Do you think global warming will harm plants and animals? Most people say yes. Do you think global warming will harm future generations? Again, most people say yes, I think it will. Do you think global warming will harm people in developing countries? We're starting to see a little bit more blue here, but it's still mostly orange, right? So people pretty much agree, let's recap, people pretty much agree that climate change will affect plants and animals, future generations, people in developing countries. What do those three things have in common? They are far away from us in space, in time, or in relevance, right? But then the rubber starts to hit the road. Do you think global warming will harm people in where? In the United States. That's a lot lighter yellow and there's quite a few blue counties here. But then they ask one more question and it is this, do you think global warming will harm you? We don't think it matters to us. Most people agree climate is changing. Most people agree it may harm people in the future, but most of us don't think it matters to us. So ironically, question three, the one that the least people wanted the answer to, it's the question most of us get wrong. Isn't that interesting? Why is it? Well, I think one of the reasons is that when somebody says global warming, what's the first image or picture that pops into your head? Nowadays, it might be something like the wildfires in California or hurricanes in the Gulf Coast. But for the last 10, 20, 30 years, the number one picture that would pop into people's head when you said global warming was of something that is big, something that is white, something that is furry, and something that very few people Oh, I'm sorry, we're at 41% here in Pitt County, so a bit less than average. Something that very few people have seen in real life in the wild, a polar bear. See what I mean? So if you ask people, why does climate change matter over the last 20, 30 years, most people would say, oh, because of the polar bears. But the reality is that climate change matters because it affects us. Yes, you and me. Why? It's because our entire society is built on the assumption that climate is stable, on the assumption that we have the single tree that is weather, we have the forest that is climate, right? And we assume that the long-term average and the highs and the lows that we've seen in the past, we assume they can predict what we see in the future. And so what do we do? We use this information to plan. To plan what? to plan almost everything. We use it to plan our building codes, what type of crops we grow, where and when and how, how much energy we're gonna need, where our flood zones are, how much water we have available for us. We use past conditions to plan almost every aspect of our lives, our infrastructure, our economy, our food and water and energy systems. Everything depends on a stable climate. But planning for the future based on what happened in the past, when climate was very stable over the history of human civilization on this planet, it's been very stable. You have ups and downs, but over the long term, it's been very stable. Planning for the future based on the past is like driving down the road looking in the rearview mirror. It works great if you are on a dead straight road, right? If you're on a dead straight road, you can drive down the road looking in the rearview mirror. But what happens if there's a curve in the road? If there's a curve in the road and you're looking backwards, you're gonna run off the road and have an accident. That's why climate change matters, because there's a curve in the road. We can't just keep on planning the way we have for hundreds of years based on the past. We will run off the road. We care about climate change because it affects future conditions that determine every aspect of our lives and our planning from the clothes you have in your wardrobe, which is not so important, but still dependent on climate, to how your house is built, where your house is built, how much our food and water costs, all that kind of thing. And I'm not done yet. 
not only is the long-term average changing, but you know what else is changing? The variability is changing too, yes. We care about a changing climate because it takes the risks we already face today and it makes them worse. Remember I showed you this map already, right? I already showed you this map of how we naturally get weather and climate disasters. We get hurricanes, obviously you all know. We get floods, we get droughts, we get storms. That's just natural and it's part of life on this planet. But it's like we have a pair of dice and you always have a chance of rolling a double six. What's a double six? Hurricane Matthew, Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Ike, a drought, a heat wave, a storm. As the planet warms decade by decade by decade, it's as if climate change is sneaking in and taking one of these numbers and turning it into a six too. And then it takes another number and turns it into a six. And then it takes a number and turns it into a seven. And all of a sudden you're rolling a double seven and you say, how could something like this happen? We've never had anything this big or this strong before. That's climate change. So where and how is climate change loading the dice against us? Let me give you a couple of very specific examples. Number one, as the air warms, it can hold more water vapor. So when a storm comes along today, there's a lot more water vapor for that storm to sweep up and dump on us than there was 50 or 100 years ago. And because of that, our heavy precipitation is increasing. It's increased 27% across the Southeast since the 1950s, 55 and 42% across the Midwest and the, or the Northeast, I should say, and the Midwest. Why do we care about that? Because it affects us. Sea levels rising. Sea level is rising twice as fast now as when satellite observations began 25 years ago. So sea level is not just rising linearly, sea level is rising non-linearly like this. It's getting faster. Why do we care about that? Because we live along the coasts. NOAA, not Noah's Ark, but NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA has showed that rising seas are increasing the water during our high tides, right? Because we get high tides naturally, but high tides plus rising sea levels are already flooding many coastal communities. In Miami Beach, they are raising the level of the streets by two feet to keep them above the water. In the Carolinas, it is estimated that sea level rise has already sunk Carolina beach properties by $1.6 billion. This has already happened, it's not the future. And in the next 10 years, it's estimated that Florida coastal homes could lose on average, some of them a lot more, but on average, 15% of their value within the next 10 years. This issue is here and now. It is not future generations. It is not people in developing countries. It is not only plants and animals. It is you. It is me. It is our neighbors and our friends. It is people living right here, living right now, who are being affected. What else is happening? Well, hurricanes. Hurricanes are fueled by warm ocean water. And in fact, that's why once hurricanes go ashore, like Hurricane Sally just did, that's why they don't usually maintain their hurricane status very long. They usually turn into a tropical storm and then eventually a tropical depression over land because they're unplugged from the wall or the outlet, so to speak. Their power source is the ocean and the ocean is warming. Remember how I talked about that extra blanket we're wrapping around the planet? 90% of the heat being trapped by that extra blanket is going into the ocean where it is powering stronger storms. We are not seeing more frequent hurricanes. Some years we have a lot like this year. Some years we don't have that many like last year, but we are seeing the storms intensifying faster. They're getting bigger. They're getting stronger and they are getting slower, which is not good news because they sit over us for longer and dump more water, right? And we're even starting to be able to put more numbers on how much more rain we have. So for Hurricane Harvey, which happened three years ago, 
it's estimated that about 40% of the rain that fell during Hurricane Harvey would not have occurred if the same hurricane had happened 100 years ago. If you know your hurricane history, you know that there was a devastating hurricane, the Galveston hurricane, that hit in 1900. It is still the deadliest hurricane in U.S. history in terms of the number of people who were killed by it because there was no warning system, so nobody got out of the way. But we know today that when hurricanes are happening, there's a lot more rainfall. Why? Because warmer air holds more water vapor. So when a storm comes along, there's more water vapor for that storm to sweep up and dump on us, right? And hurricanes are very big storms. Climate change is also making our extreme heat more frequent. And we know how that affects us. It affects our health. It affects our power bills. It affects our agriculture and more. What else is happening? Well, we can't not talk about what's in the news right now, can we? So in December 2017, we're going back over three years. In December 2017, the Thomas Fire set the record for the greatest area burned by a wildfire in California um, during the time that humans were living there and keeping records. And then just eight months later, the ranch fire broke the record for the biggest wildfire. And then just four months or three months later, the campfire broke the record for the biggest wildfire. And then what are the headlines these days? The headlines are the massive wildfires across Oregon and across California. And of course, there's another wildfire that is yet again breaking the record for the largest wildfire in California. So when we see these things happening, when we see Alaska last year had its worst wildfire season, British Columbia in Canada had its worst wildfire season in 2018, the Fort McMurray wildfire in Alberta in 2016 was the most uh, costliest insured damage in all of Canada of any kind. And of course, back in January this past year, which sort of seems like about 10 years ago now, right? But back in January, just this past year, what was happening in Australia? Bushfires again. When we see these things happening, the question is not, did climate change cause the event? The question is, did climate change make it worse? Most fires in the United States, in the lower 48 states, are the result of accidental human ignition. They're not the result of arson. Only 7% of large fires in California are due to deliberate arson. The majority are accidental, like what? Like gender reveal parties, fireworks, or people dumping a load of burning trash into the dry brush, or electrical power lines sparking, or somebody leaving something plugged in in their garage and they're um, shorting out and starting a fire. In uh, Canada and Alaska, the majority of wildfires are started by lightning. The question is not, did climate change cause the fire? Because climate change doesn't cause somebody to, you know, toss burning trash into the brush, obviously. But the question is, did climate change make it worse? And the answer to that is yes, and here's how. Imagine that you toss a match into a pile of relatively green wood. What happens? Not much. Imagine you toss a match into a pile of bone dry kindling. What happens? It immediately ignites. There's sparks flying everywhere. You might have to be careful it doesn't start a fire beside it. That's the difference between with or without climate change. So, you know, I talked about the dice being loaded against us, right? So climate change is loading the weather dice against us by increasing the area burned by wildfires. And in fact, since the 1980s, we know that without a changing climate, since the 1980s, we would have had about 10 or 11 million acres burned by wildfire because wildfire is a natural part of the ecosystem there, right? You get wildfires. But with climate change, drying out the vegetation, making that pile of bone dry kindling essentially, with climate change, we have seen almost 25 billion acres, or sorry, 25 million acres burned. And we, we people, people we know, are being affected personally by hurricanes here, by wildfires there, by floods in the Midwest a year ago last March. Wherever we live, we are being affected by climate change. We don't have to care about it because of the polar bear. We don't have to care about it because of future generations. We don't have to care about it because of people in developing countries, although they are definitely suffering even more than we are. We care about it because it affects 
all of the other things that we already care about. Things as basic as our food and our water and the safety of our homes and the economy and our health. So the best description that I've heard of climate change comes from the US military. And it is climate change is a threat multiplier. It takes the issues we're already worried about today and it makes them worse. That's why we care. And in poor countries, it is even worse. This is a study that some scientists did last year. They showed that in poor countries, climate change has increased the economic gap between richer and poorer countries by as much as 25% already. Everywhere that you see a brown or tan color, the average GDP per person has gone down because of climate change. Everywhere you see a green color, the average GDP has gone up. You don't see a lot of green colors. There's a little bit, there's Canada, there's Europe and Russia, but across not just the US, but Central America, South America, Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, it's a lot of brown. The poorest countries are getting poorer. We also know that climate change disproportionately affects certain people, people who are already poor, people who are already vulnerable. It affects women and children more, especially in poor countries. It affects indigenous communities more. It affects people of color more, even right here in the United States. So climate change is profoundly unfair and it affects every single one of us. So why do we care? Again, it's because we only have to be human to care about climate change. And every single one of us is human. So now we're on to the very last question. And this is the question that the most people wanted answers to. After we're done, we have plenty of time for me to take your questions. And you're gonna be typing your questions into poll everywhere after we're done. So save them up, don't put them in the chat, don't put them in the Q&A on Zoom. Save your questions till the end. But this is the last question that I'm answering now. And then after that, I'm gonna be taking your questions. Okay, here we go. What can you do about it? When somebody says climate change or global warming, we normally think, well, maybe I could change my light bulbs. Maybe I could recycle. Solar panels are too expensive. I could probably look at getting a more efficient car next time I get a car. But we feel like none of these are gonna really make a dent, right? Because we're just one person. And what difference does a light bulb or even 10 light bulbs or recycling or even a full car or a set of solar panels, we feel like, does that really make a big enough difference? Well, I was wondering the exact same thing because I study this problem and I know how big it is and I know how important it is, but I was wondering what should we do about it? And these maps that I was showing you, these maps are where I found the answer. So we left off at this map. Do you think global warming will harm you personally? And you can see most people are saying no. If you're wondering what the orange counties are, the most concerned people about climate change are Hispanic Catholics and Native Americans. And you might say, well, of course, you know, the Pope wrote the encyclical about climate change five years ago. Of course, Catholics would be concerned. Not so fast. It turns out that white Catholics and white evangelicals are the least concerned about climate change. It isn't the Pope that's determining people's opinions. It's our politics. Climate change is the most politically polarized issue in the whole country right now. Racism is number two and coronavirus is number three. But this is a map of, do you think it matters to us personally? But there's another map that's darker blue. What do you think it is? Do you think, or I should say, do you ever talk about it? It turns out people said, no, we don't ever really talk about it. Here's the connection. If you don't talk about something, why would you care? If you don't care, why would you ever do anything about it, right? So for me, this is when a light bulb went off. I realized we're not talking about it. And every single one of us is able to talk. You could use your mouth. You can do it in social media. You can talk in many different ways. We communicate, I should say, maybe is a better way to put it. We can communicate. So if we don't care about it, it's because we're not talking about it, because we talk about the things that we care about it about. So why aren't we talking about it? We aren't talking about it because we don't think it matters to us. We think it matters to the future or to people who live far away, but not us. And we don't think there's anything positive that we can do to fix it. 
So what's the answer? The answer is to talk about what? To talk about how it does matter to us in the places where we live, in ways that matter and are relevant today, and talk about what else? Talk about positive, constructive things that we can do to fix it. These are the two most important things to talk about. So ordinarily, when somebody says talk about it, we think, okay, climate's changing and I'm getting worried. Ice sheets are melting, sea level's rising, the west is burning down, the hurricanes are getting stronger. We get worried and so what we do is we instinctively share more scary data. We think if so-and-so isn't scared enough or if they're not worried enough, they need to be more worried. So I'm gonna make them more worried by sharing more scary information with them. Here's the thing, that is not the way our human brains work. If we're not really that worried about something or we don't wanna talk about it, or we don't even, you know, we're not even sure it's real. If somebody shares more scary information with us, we shut down. And what happens? Nothing happens because as neuroscientist Tally Sherratt says, she's a neuroscientist and she studies how the brain works, fear and anxiety cause us as humans to withdraw and to freeze and to give up rather than taking action. And so in a vicious cycle, all that happens is climate changes more. This is how we usually communicate. And this is why it doesn't work. So you have to break this cycle. How do we do that? By talking about how climate change affects us personally, what it matters to us, not Greenland, but right here where we live in Greenville, and all the positive things that we can do to fix it. So what happens then is climate changes, right? We're worried, yes. What do we do? Instead of sharing more scary data, we share how it affects us and positive solutions that are being implemented to help fix it. As researcher Matthew Goldberg says, he says climate conversations break the cycle. They create a true positive feedback loop where the more we know, the more we care, the more we care, the more we talk about it. Instead of feeling depressed and discouraged, we feel empowered and hopeful. And what's the result of feeling empowered and hopeful? Action. As neuroscientist Tally Sherratt continues, she says, our human brain, and this is fascinating, our human brain is built to associate forward action, both physically as well as mentally, forward action, with a reward, not with avoiding harm. So if we want people to move forward to take action, telling them to do so to avoid harm is not the way our brain is built. Our brain is built to freeze when we're confronted with harm. If we want to move forward, our brain is built to move forward to something positive. So what she says, and she's not talking about climate change here at all, but I think it's so applicable to climate change. She says, reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not dread, if you want people to move forwards. Let that sink in for a minute. When we are worried, we usually share scary information. It causes people to turn off and shut down and nothing happens. If we stop ourselves in our tracks at the gray circle and we say, let me think about what I really want to say to people, it really matters. Here's what's happening. Here's why it matters to us. Here's what we can do to fix it. Here's what these other people are doing. There's really some good stuff happening and we can be part of it. That empowers people and it brings them along on the action too. Totally different. Isn't that interesting? Now, there's one study that was done recently I wanted to highlight for you because it was done in North Carolina. It was done in Raleigh. They looked at whether kids were able to change their parents' opinions. They taught middle school children about climate change, not their parents, just the kids, but they found that the parents of the kids who learned about climate change expressed higher levels of concern afterwards. In other words, the kids were teaching their parents. 
the effects were strongest among male parents and more conservative parents. And I love this, daughters were especially effective at influencing their dads. Isn't that awesome? Talking about it really does make a difference. All of us and even kids. So how do we have these conversations? We start, and this is really important, you have to start with something that you genuinely share with the person or people that you're talking with. What if you don't know anything you share with them? Then get to know them. Figure out what makes them tick. What do they enjoy doing? What do they love? If you really can't find anything at all, nothing that you have in common with them, then you're not the right person to have that conversation. But most of the times we can find something. And once we have connected over something that we genuinely share, then we can connect the dots to how climate change is affecting us. And do not forget the third step. The third step is to inspire with positive solutions about what we can do to fix it. So let me give you a couple of examples just to break it down. Okay, what types of things can we bond over? I have bonded over living in Texas. I've bonded over being a mom. I've bonded over the fact that I'm a Christian. I've bonded over knitting, which I enjoy. I don't have military experience, but I have definitely bonded over Rotarian values, for example, over things that I enjoy doing. Who you are is unique. There are things about you that make you who you are. And what makes you who you are is the perfect thing to make you the person to care about climate change because we only have to be a human living here on this planet to care about climate change, but we all care about it for different reasons because of who we are. There's no one reason. So I care about it because I live in Texas. I'm a mom. I'm a Christian. I love um, skiing in the winter. I love snow. I care about it because of who I am. And so I can tell people who also like skiing why we might care about climate change. I can tell people who are Christians, as a Christian, why I care about climate change because the Bible says that we have responsibility over every living thing on this planet and we are to care for the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world and those are the people who are suffering from the impacts of climate change most today. I can talk about how it's affecting the place where we live and why you'd care about it if you live in North Carolina or South Carolina or Texas. So now I want to ask you, why do you care about climate change? I care about climate change because I am what? Fill in the blank. We have a good word right here, human. Yes, that's a great word. You care about it because you are a human or a human being. Why else do you care about climate change? Because you're a grandparent? Absolutely because you're a parent, yes, for sure. A surfer, yeah, absolutely. A student, a Christian, mm -hmm. a sister, yes, love it. A geographer, outdoorsy, a dog mom, yes, your dog cares too, if they could talk to you. You love nature, you're a teen, yep, you're an archeologist, love that. Oh, I got another skier there. Because you live close to the Atlantic coast, yes, absolutely. Yep, because you're responsible, yes. Good, I love this. So look at this. I mean, human is the biggest answer, right? But aside from that, we've got all kinds of different answers. We've got different types of scientists. We've got different types of relationships with people. We've got different things that we enjoy doing. Whoever you are, you care about climate change for different reasons, and that makes you the perfect person to talk to somebody else who is also a student, a mother, a skier, a Christian, a chemist, a dog mom, a grandparent, somebody who lives next to the Atlantic coast, you're the perfect person to talk to that type of person. See? Then once you've bonded over shared values and showed why it matters, you can talk about solutions. And look, if I can talk about solutions in Texas, you can talk about solutions anywhere. In Texas, we have the first carbon neutral airport in the entire North America, DFW airport. We have the biggest army base in the US that's been powered by clean energy for two years now, saving taxpayers $150 million. We have entire towns that are 100% clean energy. What's happening in North Carolina? Well, 
on the right hand side, we actually have a very old figure. It's seven years old. I couldn't find a newer one. There probably is one, but this one's so pretty. But seven years ago, there was already 57 counties that had benefited from at least a million dollars of investment in renewable energy. The clean energy job market was increasing in North Carolina. A recent poll on the left hand side, this is a poll from last year, asked, would you support, would you be more likely to support or oppose a lawmaker who supports legislation to provide additional ways for home or business owners to finance energy efficiency improvements? What have we got here? We've got 88.5% of people in North Carolina would support that. Would you support a lawmaker who supports policies to encourage renewable energy options? 85% of people would say yes. This is already happening in North Carolina today. Let's go back to those maps we were looking at, but now let's look at solutions. Do you support requiring utilities to produce at least 20% of their electricity from renewable sources? We're already at 20% in Texas. 65% of Pitt County residents would say yes. How about, do you think the governor should be doing more to address climate change? 53% of people say yes, 53. That's pretty high. Might be higher if you had a few more conversations. We can talk about positive solutions that are happening in industry, big corporations going with clean energy. We can talk about things that are happening in faith communities. I work with the World Evangelical Alliance and they're planning to make sure that one out of every five of their facilities are powered by clean energy within the next five years. We can talk about stories like the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum going solar or the fact that United Airlines is flying biofuel flights, which are almost carbon neutral, not quite, but almost. That's pretty cool. I love telling stories of what's happening around the world, of kids that are doing amazing things and things that are happening in developing countries where they don't have access to any electricity at all, and clean energy is revolutionizing their lives. People don't realize that it has been six years, 2014, it has been six years since new clean energy installations overtook new fossil fuel installations. Six years since the tide turned. And I love Project Drawdown. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but Project Drawdown is fantastic. I'm gonna drop a link to that in the chat here because I want you to click on that as well. If you go there, they have listed more than 100 different solutions to climate change. And yes, they have clean energy, and yes, they have technology, but they also have all kinds of solutions like conservation agriculture, ecosystem restoration, coastal wetland protection, uh, education of women and girls, reducing our food waste. Did you know that food waste is a it would be the third biggest country in the world in terms of its heat trap and gas emissions if, um, if it were a country. Food waste is a huge source of heat trap and gas emissions. Eating lots of cheap meat is too. Eating lower down the food chain, having a meatless Monday. Um, efficiency and saving money helps too. So if you want a positive story to talk about, go to drawdown.org. I put the link in the chat, click on it, read a few articles, and you will learn some really amazing things that you can share with other people. How do I have these conversations? I want some examples. This wasn't enough. That's what my TED Talk is for. This was not my TED Talk. There's no point in me giving you my TED Talk. You can go watch it. So in my TED Talk, I talk about how we bond with people, how we connect with people, and how we inspire people. And I give lots more examples on how do we have these conversations with a relative, with a politician, with a corporation, with a neighbor, with a colleague. How do we have these conversations? There's more to learn, but the basics you already know. You start with what? Something you agree on, not something you disagree on. Then you connect the dots explaining how climate change matters to us here and now. And then, do not forget the last step, you inspire with positive things that people are already doing and things that we can get on board with that will help all of us and give all of us a better life. The most effective thing we can do about climate change is talk about it by bonding, connecting, and inspiring. And the best person to do that, it turns out, is not me. The best person, according to the social science, is you. You, friends and family, are the number one most effective person to have these conversations. And that is the most important thing that you can do. Thank you. 
As a student studying weather and climate, I am very interested in the long-term effects of climate change. What has been something that surprised you the most? I'm guessing that was what, what you got cut off with at the end. Um, unfortunately, something that has surprised me the most is not good news. So I'm an author of the National Climate Assessment and I wrote chapter 15, Potential Surprises. And what we concluded, if you look here, what we concluded is not good. We concluded that if you read the very end here, I'll highlight it, climate models are more likely to underestimate than overestimate the amount of long-term future change. That is not good news and that definitely surprised me. Not in a good way. But then the other thing that surprised me that I learned, not from the physical science but from the social science, the other thing I learned was this. And it's the subject of a global weirding episode. So here's global weirding. Our first, our most recent two episodes are actually on climate change and the coronavirus, if you're interested in that. But what surprised me the most was this one right here. If I just explain the facts, surely people will understand, right? Because as a scientist, I thought, you know what? All we have to do is just explain the facts. And if we just explain the facts, people will change their minds. But it turns out, as I explained to you from neuroscience, that's not the way our brains work. We have to show why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it to change minds. So that was a huge surprise to me and it completely changed the way that I communicate about climate change. And you wouldn't have even gotten the presentation that I give today if that hadn't surprised me a number of years ago and I haven't spent years thinking about it ever since then. Do you think there's a time when we can no longer slow down the rate of climate change and when will we reach that point? What you are talking about is actually what I, we talk about in that chapter that I just showed you. And I'll give you the link if you wanna read that chapter. It is science2017.globalchange.gov. If we enter a, a, a state where we, we reach a tipping point, where the climate system just kind of goes over, tips over and just kind of starts changing, that's where we can't slow it down anymore. But right now we absolutely can slow it down. It's, it's too late to fix all the impacts of climate change though because some of them are here today. It's as if we've been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for years and we already have some lung damage. But we don't have emphysema, we don't have lung cancer and we're not dead yet. So when's the best time to stop smoking? Now. When, how much? As much as possible. In the same way, there's no magic carbon amount that's going to save us from all impacts because some of them are already here today. Wildfires, burning more area, stronger hurricane sea level rise. But we do know that we are able to slow down the rate of climate change by rapidly reducing our carbon emissions, eventually eliminating them. And as it talks about in Project Drawdown, so if you go to drawdown.org, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back in the soil and the plants where we want it. Carbon in the soil is fantastic. It is healthy, it is good. We want carbon in the soil. So if we can reduce our carbon emissions and suck some of the CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil, we absolutely can slow down the rate of climate change. And the more we do it, the better off we're all gonna be. All right, there's a great question here about coronavirus. Has coronavirus helped at all in this in less traveling? So I have a whole talk that I've actually given on exactly this. Um, it is part of our Texas Tech Climate Center Science by the Glass event. But the short version is climate or the coronavirus has absolutely short-term reduced our carbon emissions by a lot, by 17% around the world and as much as 25% in China. That's great news. In fact, to meet the Paris Agreement goals, we have to reduce our emissions about 40% by 2030, maybe about 45%. So basically, in a matter of weeks, we were almost halfway there. In weeks, we were halfway to our Paris goals. I mean, that is absolutely mind-blowing when you think about it. We got halfway to our Paris goals in a matter of weeks. Here's the bad news. It didn't last. Why didn't it last? because we didn't achieve those reductions through sustainable methods. It's not sustainable for all the businesses to shut down, for kids not to go to school, for everybody around the world to stay in their homes 24 seven. It's not sustainable. So what happened as the pandemic passed, guess what? Carbon emissions shot right back up again. So does that mean we didn't learn anything? 
No, it means that we did learn that when we act, we can make a huge difference. But we have to achieve these reductions through sustainable methods. 50% of US carbon emissions could be cut through efficiency improvements, 50%, and we'd save money too. The other 50% have to be cut through clean energy and through lifestyle choices. And we also figure it, have to figure out, again, good soil conservation and smart carbon farming techniques to put some of that carbon back in the soil as well. But I think what coronavirus has showed us is that we can do it when we really understand how bad it is and how quickly we need to act. The next question actually relates specifically um, to the, the sources of energy. Nuclear energy does not produce heat trapping gases. It does produce nuclear waste, but not heat trapping gases. So why isn't it a bigger part of many clean energy portfolios? Well, if you go to drawdown, it is there. It absolutely is. But here's the key. Not the old school, traditional, conventional, large scale nuclear, which a new plant hasn't been built in, in decades. You know, they tried to build a new one in the Carolinas and it got so massively expensive that they just canceled it. So traditional conventional nuclear now is way more expensive than natural gas, than wind, and then solar, even including storage. So why is nuclear still on the list with Project Drawdown? It's because there's new nuclear technology that's being developed that's very interesting. It's what's called mini or modular nuclear reactors. It's a company called New Scale out in Oregon that's doing it. And then it's actually a company in England called Rolls-Royce. You may have heard of it. It actually is the car company. They're also doing mini modular nuclear. And it's much more affordable, in fact, because nuclear can run 24 seven, whereas wind does not. Wind is about 35%. Um, it, it produces 100% at about 35% of the time. The cost of this new mini modular is actually pretty close to that of wind with storage, solar with storage, or natural gas with storage today. So it's new technology, they're just testing it out right now, but if it is affordable, it definitely would have a role. The only reason why nuclear hasn't had a bigger role so far is simply because it really isn't affordable compared to how massively cheap wind and solar have gotten the last couple of years. So in LA last year in California, solar energy plus storage right, because the sun doesn't shine at night, solar energy plus storage was cheaper than natural gas on the open market, which is pretty amazing. How do you personally prevent climate change and are you a vegetarian? Well, here's the thing. Climate change requires system-wide solutions. Even if every single one of us who cared enough to act did everything we could, we wouldn't even be able to make a dent in the problem. We need system-wide solutions, but systems are made up of people. So that is why as individuals, the number one most important thing we can do is talk about it. The number two is advocate for change at every level, in your school or university, in your church or place of worship, in your business or organization, in your city, in your social organization or club or group, in your state and at the federal level. And of course, voting is also part of that. And you saw those really great polls that so many people in North Carolina support candidates or would support a candidate who supports clean energy, who supports efficiency improvements. Now, what do we talk about? Well, I do absolutely talk about what I've done personally to reduce my carbon footprint. I stepped on the carbon scales. There's a really great um, tool called the Cool Carbon Calculator from Berkeley. And if you fill out all the information, where you live, what type of car you drive, how much you travel, how much meat you eat, all that kind of things, it will tell you where the biggest part of your carbon footprint comes from. And everybody's gonna get a bit of a different answer because it depends on the ways that we live. So when I did that, I wasn't sure what I was going to get. I got flying. Flying was the biggest part of my personal carbon footprint by a long shot, way ahead of anything else. So when I got that, I decided I have to do something about this because I wasn't flying around on vacations. I was flying around to you know, study climate change and talk to people about climate change. So I decided that I was going to, and this was a number of years ago, pre-coronavirus, I decided I was going to transition about 80% of the talks that I give to virtual low carbon talks like this one. So you're part of this. And when I traveled, I was only going to travel if I could bundle together multiple events in one spot such that I was flying somewhere to give 
three or five, or actually I've gotten better at it, my record is 29 events, talks, meetings, panels, and that was in seven days, um, so that the average carbon footprint of each event is very small, as if I got in my little plug-in hybrid and drove you know, an hour or two away from my house to each event. So that's the most important thing that I did. But I also figured out that food waste was a huge way that we were producing heat trapping gases. So I changed the way I grocery shop. I got rid of our extra freezer. I put in racks to hang my clothes there instead. I take the reusable bags to the supermarket. We replaced our light bulbs. Um, two years ago, my husband actually surprised us with solar panels because he found a really good deal and a really good tax um, break to get them. And we also decided to eat lower down the food chain. We're not vegetarian, but we eat meat very sparingly. We mostly eat fish and we buy the meat from locally produced grass fed beef because grazing of animals, not an industrial agriculture, but small farms that graze their animals, as the animals graze, they're actually helping to put carbon back in the soil, which is incredible. It's all of the industrialized meat production that is not only harmful to animals, but it is also harmful to the environment, to our water quality, and to climate change. So there's so many things we can do, but here's the thing. The most important thing we can do is talk about them. And let me give you one story to illustrate what I mean. About four or five years ago, there was a young teenager who was really worried about climate change. In fact, she was so worried that she got depressed. So she researched how her family could reduce their carbon footprint. She convinced her parents to stop flying. She convinced them to adopt a vegetarian or vegan diet. They, um, you know, insulated their home, replaced their light bulbs, did everything they could to live the lowest carbon life they could. And if that is the only thing they did, now I say only, of course, like this, because that's a lot. But if that's what they did, none of us would know who she was. But she did one more thing. And you know what that was? She took a piece of white cardboard and she painted a few words on that piece of cardboard using your voice. The words were a school strike for climate. And then she went and she sat outside a building with her sign. And of course, everybody knows her name now. Her name is Greta. And the reason why we know her name is because she used her voice to advocate for change. That is how powerful our voices can be. All right. I think we have time for a couple of last questions. There have been so many great questions here. You guys have been fantastic. I don't want to keep you, but I will speed through a couple of questions just to get those answered. All right. What are your thoughts on climate engineering? Engineering the planet to help cool it down is something that many people are discussing. But at this point, it is kind of like giving every single person on the entire planet an experimental coronavirus vaccine that has not even gone through stage one, two, or three testing. Yes, that's what geoengineering is like. We need to study it, we need to understand the risks, and we need to recognize that it is not a cure-all. It's more like a partial Band-Aid that might fix a tiny little bit of the problem, but by no means all of it, and might have some very nasty side effects. I also have a global weirding episode on that that you might be interested in. I'm aware that there's evidence of climate based on ice sheets and other sources to predict the climate of millions of years. Yes, we can go back very far in time using all kinds of things like ocean sediments and ice cores. And when we go back in time, here's what we see in a nutshell. We see that carbon dioxide levels have not been this high for 15 million years. So in other words, the last time they were this high, there was no humans. And let me add this. If we only believe that the planet is 6,000 years old, then we have never, ever seen anything like this before. Our conditions are entirely unprecedented in the history of human civilization on this planet. You have to go back millions of years to see anything like what we saw today. If we continue on our current pathway, our carbon dioxide levels will be as high as we have ever seen them in the history of the planet. And here's the truly scary thing. We know that the amount of carbon we are putting into the atmosphere every year has no precedent. As far back as we can go in time, the last time climate changed the fastest for natural reasons, there was about one-tenth the carbon going from the ocean into the atmosphere at that time. That was how it was driving the warming. One-tenth the carbon that we humans are producing from digging up and burning coal and gas and oil. So that's what we see when we go back in time. We see that, sure, it has been warmer before, but there were no humans. 
There was no agriculture. There was no infrastructure. There weren't 8 billion people on the planet. We've been driving down this straight road for the entire course of human civilization. And there is a very steep curve. Our wheels are already on the rumble strip. We need to look ahead down that curve. We have to do everything we can to make it as not steep as possible in order to make it around safely together. Now, a couple more questions here. Um, just a second. What is the best one-stop shop? That's a great question. Let me give you some resources to end with, okay? I want to introduce you to the National Climate Assessment. The National Climate Assessment has a chapter for every region. So it's got a chapter for the Southeast, chapter number 19. It's got a chapter for every sector. And it's an incredibly useful resource that explains how climate is changing and how it's affecting you in the places where we live. So please check out the National Climate Assessment and I'm gonna put the link in the chat right here. Where else? If you wanna know more about questions about climate science, skeptical science is fantastic. They have this list of the most frequently asked questions about science and answers to all of them. So you can, they're even numbered by popularity. So you can click on here and you will get a good answer to every single question like, hasn't climate changed before, so why is this a big deal? You have a basic answer, you have an intermediate answer, and you have lots of more information. Globalweirdingseries.com has a whole series of short videos that I've done that talk about climate change and coronavirus, climate change in the Southeast US, uh, what does the Bible say about climate change is actually our most popular episode, and all kinds of other things like, well, what's the big deal with a few degrees, or I'm not a tree hugger, why am I supposed to care about climate change? We have pretty much all your frequently asked questions covered here. And then the last link I wanna give you is to my TED Talk, because my TED Talk talks more about how do we have conversations with that skeptical relative, with um, somebody we know who just really isn't on board with this thing. How do we have conversations with people that actually make a difference, that can uh, begin with what we have in common, that connects the dots to why it matters to us, and that end with talking about solutions that we can agree on. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been recorded. It will be made available online later if you missed it or you want to watch it later, you want to share it with somebody. And have a great night. Good night, all.